For the program today, that is called Building Better Plants Biotechnology at BASF, we have with us two experts, and let me introduce you to them. So we have Kate Swery, that she's a scientist at BASF working on automation and experimental design. She obtained her PhD from NCSU in plant pathology and has worked in agricultural biotechnology since then, working to find sustainable solutions to pest controls. And we have Alberto Bresan. He has been working in industry and academic labs with the intent to find sustainable solutions to control agricultural pests in temperate and tropical regions. He has worked in several countries and US states, including US, Italy, France, Hawaii, and North Carolina. He has traveled a lot. He earned his PhD in crop protection and has focused on the control of plant diseases transmitted by insects. He's currently an interim uh, group leader at BASF with a focus on the screen of new plant traits, leads for pets controls. So guys, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having us. So. Thank you. So to start the, the program, we are going to watch a video that you prepared for us. Okay, so it's a 10 minutes long video. So we're going to, um, to share it with you guys, and then we are going to get all these questions. Okay, so let me share my computer. And if you can see it, let me know. Yep, we can see it. Okay, let's start. Hello, and welcome to Bugfest. I'm the squares Harris. again. I'm a scientist at BASF, and I'm an automation expert. And hello, I'm Alberto Bressan and I'm a group lead in the screening group in the BSF Seed and Trade. Hey Kate, today we are going to talk about agricultural biotechnology. Can you tell us why it's important and what do we care about that? Yeah, Alberto, sure. Um, so what we're talking about today is um, taking genes and traits from the environment and then putting those into plants um, in order to give uh, those plants kind of a boost over the plants that we currently have on the market. And so uh, what we really wanted to focus on today is pests in particular. So uh, pests are a really big problem in agriculture. I'm sure a lot of you have problems in your garden with um, caterpillars and things like that. And so farmers have these same problems. And so um, it's estimated that the annual crop loss from this is anywhere from like 18 to 20% worldwide. And this can translate to uh, around 470 billion US dollars every year. So it's a pretty huge problem for farmers. Um, and so that's why it's really important to us. So um, the way that we handle this currently um, is with um, integrated technologies. So we try to use multiple solutions to solve these problems in the field. And one of those solutions is agricultural biotechnology. And that allows us to put, as I said, these traits from um, bacteria and other sources into the plants that can be helpful. Um, so one of, the, one of the actually commonly used control methods in organic agriculture in the past has been using the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis as a biological control. And so in those cases, farmers would actually take these um, bacteria and actually spray them on their crops. And so then when the insect eats the crop, um, that actually helps control that insect. And so what we're doing is instead of putting the actual bacteria on the plant, we're just taking the specific gene from that bacteria that's useful and putting that into the plant so that when the insect eats the plant, we get insect control. And so that's how we do it in agricultural biotechnology. That's very interesting, Kate. Uh, and can you tell us how common uh, these uh, genetically engineered crops are used in agriculture? Yes, Alberto, they're actually used very commonly. So um, as of 2017, there were over 100 million hectares of uh, genetically engineered crops were grown worldwide. Um, a hectare is around the size of a football field, to kind of give you guys some reference. Uh, these crops are used in uh, all over the world, so the United States, uh, Europe, China. In, in Europe, for example, Spain grows a large amount of corn that's, that's actually uh, GE, genetically engineered. And uh, the United States also grows over 20, or 90, sorry, 90% of our corn is, uh, is genetically engineered. So it's very commonly used. And do you know if they are really safe? 
Yes, Alberto, actually, we have a lot of evidence that they are very, very safe. So um, the first genetically engineered crops were actually produced in 1996. So they've been on the market for over 20 years now, and there are no uh, reports of anyone actually being harmed by any crops with uh, Bt in them. Bt, again, being um, the Psyllis thuringiensis, these genes that we're talking about, that we talked about before. So. Uh, these genes, uh, to, in order to get into a plant and actually make it to the market, they all have to be rigorously tested. So at BASF, we have groups of scientists that are dedicated just to testing for safety and environmental impact. So they really go through and look at um, what is needed to make sure that these genes are, are fully safe before they're put out into the marketplace. Also in the United States, there are three different organizations that actually monitor genetically engineered plants. So the EPA, the FDA, and the USDA all um, have a hand in um, um, approving and also monitoring uh, these particular genetically engineered plants. So uh, with, with all this regulation, it can take um, many, many years to actually get through to the marketplace. So you can really feel very comfortable that these plants are, are safe to eat by the time they reach your table. So now that we've learned a little bit about why genetic engineering is so important for agriculture, Alberto, do you want to tell us a little bit about how it's actually done and how, like, what scientists do on a day-to-day -day basis to make these crops? Happy to do so, Kate. And so at BSF, a student trait, uh, we have a, a group of scientists uh, that focus on discovery and characterize new traits. Uh, for example, you mentioned about uh, the Bt, and uh, Bt historically has been used as a source of gene. Nowadays, we use uh, many other different microbes from, from where we can discover new traits. And so, uh, at BSF, we have this large collection of microbes, and we test them, uh, and we test them through our screening uh, uh, assays. And for example, we test many of the insects that feed on our crops. And uh, ideally, we want to identify those microbes that uh, control those insects. The next step in the pipeline is to uh, mine those uh, uh, microbes, uh, study their genome, and uh, find the, the gene and transfer into the plant. And uh, at that point, uh, we will be able to test this new plant for this new activity against the insects. Obviously, we don't focus only on insect nematodes also are the focus of our search fungi uh, too so alberto you mentioned nematodes what exactly are nematodes good question kate those are little worms that live on the soil and feed on the roots of several plants have you ever heard about that? Um, yes, actually. So uh, some of the nematodes that you guys probably have heard about are actually heartworms. So heartworms are, as, are nematodes and they are problematic for cats and dogs. And so they actually are one that, that you treat your, your pets for on a regular basis. Luckily, the ones we work with only infect plants and are microscopic, so they're much, much smaller. Thank you. So Alberto, uh, we've talked a little bit about how important these genes are, how do we actually get them into the plants? That's a very good question. And actually, we use uh, at BSF this technology that is mediated by, uh, by agrobacterium. And this is a special bacterium uh, that uh, has the capability of transfer the genes from the microbes into the plant. And so by using this bacterium, we ensure that we transfer those genes uh, that uh, we have selected into the new plant so that they, they acquire these new traits. Okay, so Alberto, it sounds like this is obviously a pretty complicated process. How many years does it take to get one of these genes into a plant where I might actually, you know, buy it from the supermarket? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. And, you know, in average, uh, it takes uh, more than 15 years uh, to develop uh, new genetically engineered crops. Think about all the process that uh, BSF has to go through, not only the discovery that we just described, but also field testing, uh, transferring of these new genes to uh, crops, um, parallel testing in different uh, uh, continents, and uh, obviously the regulatory aspect that you were mentioning, those are all studies that BSF need to conduct in order to clear the crop for commercial commercialization. Okay, so in closing, I wanted to talk a little bit about why this is still important uh, technology to still be constantly working on. 
uh, because if you, as you can probably imagine, the agricultural environment is a really changing, uh, it's constantly evolving. So we have new pests coming in from other sources, um, other countries, or just new pests becoming more important than old pests. And we also have current pests that have already caused some problems that can actually evolve resistance to some of the genes that we're trying to use to, to control them. So um, you can get this evol evolution of resistance in the pests that are in the field. And that means that it's really important that we as scientists continue to keep finding the next trait that's the necessary and important for us to be able to keep uh, the, the food supply in, in good shape and make sure that farmers are able to uh, grow good crops on their fields. That's a very good point, Kate. Uh, and uh, durability is another key point uh, for BSF. We need to ensure that this technology lasts and we know how good insects are to in evolving new, new biotypes uh, that uh, adapt and resist uh, to these traits. So we have to adapt uh, some technology that uh, allow to extend the life of, uh, of these uh, uh, genetically engineered crops. For example, um, we use a refuge crop. This is a, a, an area in the fields uh, that uh, conventional crops uh, is grow so that insect uh, can, population can maintain uh, that sensitivity uh, to uh, the Bt trade. Uh, another example is uh, uh, to combine uh, different uh, traits, uh, different BT traits that has a different uh, activity in the insect. And so the insect will have uh, more difficulties uh, to select uh, these resistant strains. On behalf of BASF, thank you for joining us today and learning a little bit about agricultural biotechnology and how we use it to control pests in agriculture. Okay, so that was a very interesting video. So um, let me check. So before starting, so let me introduce again the, the stars of the show. So Kate and Alberto, again, thank you for being with us today. So I'm going to invite our viewers to write their questions on the chat. So, and we can start. So, for example, we have a question from Kerry. So, how do you genetically modified crops help with the conservation of biodiversity? Um, I'll take that, I guess, to start out with. So, um, I care a lot about um, making sure that we still have lots of wild lands available. Um, I, I personally love hiking and camping and things like that. And so one of the ways that genetically modified plants can kind of contribute to biodiversity is kind of indirectly in that um, you're able to grow more crops and so more yield on a smaller amount of land. And so that allows you to not need to farm more and more land. Um, which is one of the things that really cuts the biodiversity down because farming, uh, at least in most of the modern world, is really done um, in very much a monoculture type of situation. So you're growing large amounts of the same type of plant on the field. And the reason behind that is that it allows you to produce way more on a smaller acreage. So it is actually, um, I know sometimes people get sad that you know not everything's grown like a mom and pop farmer where they've got like tons of stuff mixed in. But when you have lots of stuff mixed together, it requires a whole lot more input costs and also more space. And so that's one of the ways that with, if you modernize agriculture and try to get it to be as efficient as possible, you can really reduce reduce the amount of land usage you need. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about uh, pests. So what is the major agricultural pest? Maybe uh, Hugo can take that question. And uh, unfortunately, there are many pests and uh, pests evolved uh, and uh, um, in new areas, we always uh, have new challenging pests to, to control. Uh, in a major agricultural row crop like uh, uh, soybean, corn, cotton, uh, we have, uh, for example, a complex of Lepidopteron pests. Um, you know, I can name uh, uh, some like uh, Spodoptera, Helicoverpa. These are all important pests uh, that uh, eat uh, on the tissue of, of, of the um, of the plant and uh, devour, uh, you know, the, the yields. 
And uh, we also have, um, uh, you know, a complex uh, um, insect like a hemiptera, like sting bugs uh, that uh, really feed through a piercing sucking uh, uh, mouth part on the, um, on, on the uh, soybean pods, for example, or on the kernel of corns. And uh, there is also those like aphids, white flies, uh, that have important role uh, in also transmitting uh, uh, plant pathogens uh, like uh, viruses and bacteria, and those also are uh, major agricultural pests. And as we were mentioning uh, in the uh, interview, right, recorded interview, nematode are also an important uh, pest component uh, for those crops. Mm -hmm. So, Kate, related with the previous question, so how do these crops help uh, reduce the use of pesticides? Uh, so the way that these crops reduce pesticide use is that we're actually putting a gene that is specific for the target insect into the plant. So that gene kind of works as like an internal pesticide. Um, I want to be clear though, that's not, you're not eating a pesticide in the sense of like, it's not the type of pesticide that we spray. A lot of the pesticides that are sprayed are more um, they're usually also very targeted actually now. Um, we ha used to have ones that were much more broad spectrum in the past, but most of those are, are have been found to be problematic to the environment and have been outlawed by the EPA for good reason. Um, so, but even so, the, the ones that we're putting in the plant are actually these proteins that are, um, first of all, they, they break down relatively quickly, so a lot more quickly than, than most chemicals do. Uh, and then the other thing is that they specifically bind kind of like a puzzle piece. They fit in with uh, the gut of the insect. So when it's in the, the, the gut of the insect, the protein actually binds in the gut and then it causes these little pores to form and that causes the insects to be controlled. Um, so because of that, uh, we don't have as people or really any like mammals, we don't have the same receptors that these um, insects have. Like our gut environment is very different than an insect's gut. And so the proteins don't properly bind and so they just kind of wash through our system if we consume them. Um, so that's kind of how they work. Um, but the situation there is that if you have that control internal to the plant, then you can spray less often pesticides. So pesticides typically are still part of the control methods because like Alberto described so many different types of pests, like you're not going to have a gene for everything. Uh, and maybe eventually we will, but right now that's definitely not the case. Um, this, this, as we mentioned in the video, this takes like 15 to 20 years. So it takes a really long time to find a gene for one specific pest or even one small group of really closely related pests. If you're lucky, a lot of times it is just one pest. Um, so uh, that's why we kind of have to do like these other sprays as well still, but it can really reduce the amount that farmers have to spray through the course of the year. So it can really dramatically reduce pesticide use that way. Mm -hmm. So Judy, Judith wants to know, is the seed modified by this biotechnology or the plant in itself? The, maybe I can take this question. Uh, so when we say modified, it means like, uh, you know, we insert a gene uh, into the, uh, in the plant genome, so to say. So then uh, basically the plant uh, will produce uh, an additional gene uh, between, you know, the thousands of genes that uh, the plant produce. And so this additional gene uh, will be used to express uh, this uh, protein that Kate was mentioning. And uh, obviously, when the seeds uh, um, are produced on the plant, uh, they won't produce the protein per se, but the seed inside has this additional gene. And Alberto, uh, this uh, GE modification can affect to the flavor of the fruit that you produce or, or yeah. not? Um, yeah, so as Kate was referring uh, during the recorded interview, how uh, this, uh, you know, we go through this uh, very uh, detailed uh, regulatory path to, to make sure there is a safety and environmental standard. We call this concept also, uh, we have to show, we call it substantial equivalence. That means like uh, we compare apple to apple like uh, a a modified plant from the conventional plant, and we need to make sure that there is no changes uh, in, in many aspects uh, of the plant, like how the plant grow, uh, the quality of, uh, uh, of, the, pr of the produce, uh, the, the, 
uh, it can uh, um, um, yield. And um, the other aspect of it, though, just to remember, uh, we are talking mostly about major raw crops. Uh, we're talking about uh, soybean, uh, corn, cotton. That's where uh, uh, most of this uh, uh, GM approach is, is currently used. So we are not talking about, you know, apple or uh, peaches or uh, uh, other fruits. Okay. Yeah, typically the other like smaller crops like your tomatoes and things like that, um, it's just not profitable to be able to produce those as GMOs right now because again, the regulatory process is really intensive. So until a gene has been proven to be useful in like a row crop where you can actually make money off of the gene, it's kind of difficult for um, like smaller growers to get that, that access to that technology just because um, the regulatory process is so intensive. Mm -hmm. So Andrea wants to know, where do I get GMO garden seeds so the bugs don't eat my garden? <laughs> yeah, so kind of along what I was just saying, um, there's really not much available for like a home gardener, unfortunately, at this moment. Um, again, that's mostly because it is, while it is an old technology and that it's been around like out on the market since 1996, um, it's still newer. And again, uh, it's just, it's so expensive to get things through the regulatory process. Uh, it kind of, it's difficult to get it out to like a home grower. It's more something that typically is used by, by larger farmers for most of the row crops. Um, you will find though on your, your home garden seeds that there are some that have been bred to be resistant to certain insects and diseases. And so I would say if you're in the store and you're looking, look for those, they'll usually say on the back of the seed packet if it's been um, engineered, usually I mean, by, by breeding in this case, um, to be resistant to insects and uh, different pests. So you can still look for that, even though it won't be genetically modified, most likely. Mm -hmm. So how many generations of the seeds or plants will we, uh, will the modification be effective? Maybe I can take that question. Uh, um, so obviously when uh, the uh, seed, the plant has been engineered, uh, they will produce seeds uh, that will carry that genes and that trait. Okay, and this is can uh, um, potentially grow indefinitely. In reality, the way that variety are selected and improve in the field, there's, there's, it means like there is always a process of uh, produ production of new variety, um, and there is always this process of selecting new, better, improved varieties. So in, in the real world, uh, you know, when we launch like a commercial variety, this might last uh, like for se six, uh, seven years, and then there will be the new variety that will have a, a new trait uh, or uh, the same trait, but, uh, uh, you know, th there is this uh, continuous turnover uh, for a better uh, um, plant, uh, and that's the commercial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also say if they were asking from a sense of like, if they're asking about silencing, I don't know. I know a lot of people do know something about gene silencing, and that's where um, you can have the gene still be in the plant, but basically the plant turns that gene off so you're not getting protein production. Um, that is something that does sometimes happen with GMOs, but um, typically that doesn't, that, that is that's something that happens more in the research stage and not once it's like gotten to the field because you can choose to make sure as long as there's like only one copy of the gene typically in the, the plant, then the plant doesn't see that gene as foreign and as a problem. And so then it doesn't turn it off so that you don't typically get too much problems with gene silencing in plants by the time they get out to the marketplace. And this is a very cool uh, question that I have on the chat. What education did you get to have the job that you do? So that we're going to have a lot of viewers now and, and later on. So maybe that they are watching this video and said, hey, I want to do the job that Alberto and Kate do. So what do they have to do? Um, I'll take it first, then Alberto can tell what, what he's done too, because I think it'd be kind of nice to hear both perspectives. Um, so for me, I actually went into uh, undergrad um, originally thinking that I wanted to be a vet. Um, but for me, I was kind of lucky. The agricultural biotechnology was the name of the major that I chose because it was one of two possible pre-vet majors at, at my school. And after maybe just like the first semester, I already knew that I really liked ag biotech and I didn't, well, wasn't actually sure if I did want to go into veterinary. And so I kind of totally switched my career path and decided to go into ag biotech. And 
uh, then just kind of proceeded with that. So then I went to graduate school for plant pathology. Um, there are different types of, of post um, grad education that you can get if you want to go into this. And also, uh, we work with plenty of people who just have an undergraduate degree. That's also um, a possibility. It kind of depends on like what level you want to be at in the business. Like if you want to be a bench scientist who's working like every day with the science and you're just like, um, you know, churning through research, um, that's, that's something you often can do with just either a bachelor's or a master's. Um, if you want to be someone who's like more of a decision maker and has like maybe more, um, more of a higher level position in the business, uh, then in that case, you probably do want to get your PhD. And in that case, you would go for graduate school. And um, there's plenty of different majors you can do, um, ag biotech, um, a, just a general biology degree for undergrad is also fine to get you into most schools that, for, you know, for further education. Um, any school that has like a college of ag is a good choice too. Um, and then uh, for majors, there's people who do both plant physiology, which is more of like, how do you um, get the plant to be as productive as possible and not really looking at pests and like diseases, or there's like entomology, which would be insects and then plant pathology, which is what I did, which is plant diseases. So there's a wide variety of options that you can take. Yeah, perhaps uh, to complement on uh, Kate, uh, um, just to give you a sense of the group of me and Kate uh, work, we are like uh, around 60, 70 people and uh, uh, a lot, uh, there are some like uh, um, Kate and myself, they are like, uh, you know, uh, entomologists, uh, le um, um, nematologists, but also um, we have uh, um, scientists that are biochemists, uh, uh, molecular biologist, uh, macro, microbiologist. Uh, so we really work in a very interdisciplinary uh, teams. Uh, and, uh, and so as Kate was saying, this create uh, several opportunity to, to enter in this, uh, um, in this world. And at the same time, I would say it's a very rewarding uh, in the sense that you really can work. It is a, is a real strong scientific uh, um, environment where you can learn a lot from many, uh, many people that have different expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say along with that, one of the cool things about working in industry is that you really are working on products that you're actually eventually going to see out in the field that farmers are actually going to use, which is really cool. So one that I've worked on is uh, a gene that's responsible for nematode control. And we just had our first um, publication, like out in like a news article that is talking about how we're, we're really close. We're not releasing it yet, but we're getting close. And that was a really exciting like turn of events that's out in the public now. So it's, it's kind of cool to see if that's going to get out to farmers in maybe like three or four more years, something like that. So it's exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. So if somebody wants to learn more and do you have any website that they can go in just to check what you do and the work that you have done? Yeah, so um, this is not specifically for me, but if you just want to know more about GMOs in particular, I think the best site that I've found is GMO Answers. And this is a really cool website because it's actually put together by a collaboration of um, both like universities and corporate um, entities as well. So it's like BASF. Um, I think Monsanto has a presence there, uh, but, well, Bayer definitely does, and they own Monsanto now, um, and Syngenta, and then also um, like a whole bunch of uh, like universities are also involved. And so this is a group of scientists that have volunteered to answer people's questions. And so you can go on, and there's a ton of questions already on there that have been answered, but you can also go on and ask your own questions, and um, different scientists can, you know, pop in and chime in and, and give answers to you. So it's kind of cool. And there's just like a lot of, of really good information about GMOs in general on that website and so that's uh, www.gmoanswers.com so that's that's a very general one that I think is pretty cool. Do you agree Alberto or you or you have another one? Yeah no definitely agree there is also a lot of uh, misleading information about GMO and every time uh, I think uh, it's important that uh, uh, to go back uh, to, you know, our basic knowledge and all the science that there is behind, really, um, you know, uh, really uh, every time you go and look for GMO, really also think about your basic uh, biology information, think about how we produce them. And uh, it's our first own interest uh, as an uh, industry scientist, but also consumer, and to, to go and, you know, um, 
make sure that uh, we uh, produce something that is safe uh, for the environment and for uh, uh, the animal and human health. And so the, we do this in this spirit. Uh, and uh, as Kate was mentioning, we really believe on uh, that this technology is helping humans uh, in, in, in where, where we are. So um, please also be mindful of, of this uh, information that are around. Okay. And I think that's just a good general rule for science in general. Like, make sure you go and check your sources. Whenever you see something online, um, make sure that it has, like, a source that's that's valid. Um, and that's true for, I mean, for any science. I mean, I see all kinds of articles that I get excited about. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And then I read the actual article or I go in and it's oftentimes not really what you think it is. Like, I got really with, freaked out with uh, corona with, uh, there was, like, a mask thing where they said that the buffs don't work. And it's very clear that if you actually read the article that, um, it was just one particular type they tested. So you don't need to freak out about things until after you go in and read and, and check the, the literature. So I think that's a, a good rule of thumb for all science articles. Yeah, having a critical mindset, I think that help you to really segregate what, what is a good resource and what is a bad one. For sure, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. So we're going to wrap up this program. So first of all, Kate and Alberto, it, it was a pleasure just to have you with us today. You're in the back face, so thank you very much. Thank and you. For the rest, thank you. share my screen again, because there is not a back face without the back face shirt. So please go to backface.org to get your own uh, back face shirt or join or renew your museum membership and get one for free. If you like this program, please think about donating to at the museum at naturalsciences.org and we have news. So the museum is uh, resuming operations this Tuesday, the 22nd of this month. So we are so, so excited to have you back. And again, do you think that Backface is done? Think again, because we have tons and tons of programs that you can check at backfest.org. So please be safe and see you in the next program. Bye, everybody. Bye.